Hello, this is Rick Harnish. I'm the executive director of the High Speed Rail Alliance. Uh, we are a, a nonprofit educational organization based in Chicago, looking to bring fast, frequent, and affordable trains to the entire US. Um, we've got an exciting program today, but uh, first I want to introduce Chris Ott, who is our new deputy director. Um, uh, he comes to us from the ACLU up in Madison. So Chris will be watching the show today. And do you want to say anything, Chris, or just hello and welcome? <laughs> hello and welcome. Um, thank you, Rick. And it's, uh, it's great to be here and uh, to meet you all. And uh, looking forward to hearing uh, what, our, what our guest today, Yana Freemark, has to say. Excellent. And then I'll, uh, I'll share a, a quick little brief background here on who we are. Uh, so we strive to be the most knowledgeable independent source of what high speed rail is, um, why we need to build it and what our local leaders can do to make it happen. We educate folks through a variety of programs like this one, uh, Rotary Club presentations, which you can schedule uh, one and we can have a speaker there for it and other means. And then we give you the tools you need to educate your leaders in your state capitals or um, in DC. Um, and I'm sorry, we're not prepared today, right out of the box. Uh, the first question out of the box is tell us all about the Midwest plan that was released on Wednesday. And we're not quite prepared to do that, but we'll have a show on that very soon. Um, our speaker today is Yona Freemark. Um, he's uh, been uh, a watcher of high-speed rail issues uh, for many years and has uh, some thoughts on, on where we're headed and where we should be headed, and then we can have a discussion after that. So, Yona, if you want to take it away with your presentation, uh, we're looking forward to it. Okay. So, um, thank you again for uh, giving me the opportunity to present to you all today. Um, I'd like to begin just by introducing myself very quickly. My name is Yona Freemark and I'm a senior research associate at the Urban Institute. I hold a PhD in urban studies from MIT and I've been writing on issues related to urban planning and transportation for the last 13 years or so. Uh, my research looks at land use and transportation policy depending on the subject. Uh, and right now at the Urban Institute, I am leading up the Fair Housing and Markets Practice Area and developing something new called the Land Use Lab at Urban. That, uh, it's gonna be pretty exciting over the coming months. So the Urban Institute is a national nonprofit, nonpartisan research organization. We're based in Washington, DC. Um, and just to be clear, uh, the presentation I'm giving today is based on my research alone and should not be construed as representing the views of the Urban Institute as a whole, which does not take positions on any individual issues. So let's begin. Where do we stand on inner city rail development in the United States? We know, I'm sure everyone on this call knows that the US has an underdeveloped, underused inner city passenger rail network. We also know that there's been considerable momentum of late in the US Congress that could fund future improvements. So the question is what opportunities are out there and what challenges lie ahead for all of us who wanna see more inner city rail and high-speed rail throughout the country. So those are some of the issues I'll discuss today. I'll talk first about some of the history of American investment in intercity rail. I know that many of you are probably quite knowledgeable on this, but hopefully give you some additional insight. I'll then discuss some of the details of what, are being, what is being proposed right now in the US Congress. And then I'll highlight some of the challenges that I think lie ahead of us in terms of advocating for better rail systems in the United States. And then we, um, we can have some, some questions and answers, uh, which hopefully I'll be able to provide some insight, but I'm sure Rick and, and Chris will, will provide even more. So what is the history of inner city rail in the United States? Um, here's what I know and is very clear. Um, the US used to be a really strong rail traveling nation. Um, in the early 1920s over here, Americans were traveling up to 1.2 billion trips on inner city rail services per year. That's what's shown here on the y-axis. That number declined over the next 50 years or so, but even by 1957, Americans were taking more than 400 million trips by inner city rail every year. So let's compare that to the kind of 
passenger service that Amtrak currently provides. You can see it down here at the very bottom of the graph. It provides only about 30 million annual trips per year before the pandemic. Even when you include every trip that's taken on commuter rail, you see that actually we're just barely above total 1957 levels in terms of overall passenger rail ridership in the United States, which suggests that you know, America is not really the rail riding country we used to be as a whole. And actually, when you think about it on a per capita basis, Americans ride inner city and commuter rail trips now less than two trips per year on average. That's substantially down from 1957 and just one sixth of the levels we saw in 1920. So in other words, Americans used to take on average about 12 trips on train uh, every year, whereas now Americans take on average fewer than two. So which would mean that the average American actually doesn't even take a single round trip uh, on inner city rail. So the question for us to consider is what happened what can we do to change it? And what opportunities are there in the future? So in the 1960s, there were efforts to make change um, in the United States and actually all around the world. So in places like Japan and Italy, government investment in fast inner city rail demonstrated that we could think of the railways as truly competitive with automobile and air travel modes. So in Japan, that meant investing in First, the Tokyo, Osaka, Shinkansen. And in Italy, uh, there was the Rome, Florence, Fioretissima. So these two projects were actually the first in the world to really provide high speed inner city train service that dramatically changed what we thought of as the purpose and role of inner city rail service, you know, compared to other modes of transportation. It's worth pointing out, though, that at the same time in the United States, under the Johnson administration and under the leadership of the first U.S. DOT secretary, Alan Boyd, similar progress was actually underway. So the agency began plotting out mechanisms to improve the corridor between Boston and Washington. And you can see here, this is an image that was actually produced by the U.S. DOT of what this type of inner city rail passenger service could look like. I mean, there's a little too much highway traffic going on in this image from my, uh, from my perspective, but still you can see there was this vision of high-speed intercity trains operating between central business districts. And the US government actually worked with some of the major uh, industrial conglomerates like United Aircraft to invest in higher speed trains. So this was the turbo train that was actually put into service on some routes in the US and Canada in the late 1960s. President Johnson was a key advocate for improved rail transport. So in the mid 1960s, in 1965, the High Speed Ground Transportation Act, which by the way, came before the US Department of Transportation was actually created, was designed to begin improvements on the Northeast Corridor and funded the introduction of the Metropolitan Liner Service. So I just wanna to read to you a quote from uh, Lyndon Johnson. He said, an astronaut can orbit the earth faster than a man on the ground can get from New York to Washington. Yet the same science and technology which gave us our airplanes and our space probes, I believe, could also give us better and faster and more economical transport on the ground. And a lot of us need it more on the ground than we need it orbiting the Earth. And I think it's really interesting because to a large degree, we face the exact same circumstances today. There's been a lot of revival in space transport over the last few years, a lot of interest in sending William Shatner up into space. Uh, but our progress in the United States on inner city rail has been quite minimal, despite this sort of rhetoric that was coming out of Washington in the 1960s. And I think part of the reason for that is that the, the sort of Lyndon Johnson era investments did not come quickly enough to save the inner city passenger rail system in the United States, which was privately owned and operated up until the 1970s. So in 1970, Penn Central, which was a combination of the New York Central and the Pennsylvania Railroad, was on the verge of bankruptcy and wanted to simply stop service on most of its passenger routes. And ultimately, the US Congress decided that its response was going to form the National Railroad Passenger Corporation, which we now know as Amtrak. And that began operations in 1971. The problem is that from the very beginning, there was sort of a general agreement in Washington that Amtrak was not going to be 
thought of as a true avenue for the future wasn't going to be that sort of uh, revolutionary change in inner city transport that Lyndon Johnson envisioned, but rather it was going to be something always operating sort of on the fumes of the past. And the Nixon administration, which was in office at the time, took a relatively limited interest in funding Amtrak. They did see the need, ultimately, of putting together a new national service, but they funded it and thought of it as sort of a more like uh, tourist train approach to, uh, to national operating service. So this is the map that they put together in the initial planning do documents of the basic system proposed for Amtrak when it was created in 1971. And as you can see here from this map, the program's conceptors saw it primarily about serving long distance routes between major cities, not about creating new high speed inner city lines that were by then in operation or in detailed planning in Japan, Italy, France, and Germany. So that choice from the very beginning to see Amtrak as this relatively slow speed national network, I think handicapped the ability of the inner city rail passenger service to provide the groundbreaking change in the way people got around that was happening in those other countries around the world. And Though there was some immediate term investment in the 1970s and early 1980s, as I'll show in a few slides, overall, the US chose not to invest in major new corridors and improved service, but rather to underinvest systematically. And actually the problem increased over time. So what this graph is showing here is the per capita investment in rail infrastructure from 1995 to 2018. And what this is doing is comparing the United States with the other members of the G7, so the other most wealthy large countries around the world. And you can see here on the bottom in green and yellow that the US and Canada have systematically underinvested compared to the other nations in the G7 over the past 30 years or so. So as of 2018, the US was investing about half per capita what Germany was spending on inner city rail and actually all rail services. And it was spending much, much less than France or Germany. And this accounts for both the investment that was going into freight rail and the investment that was going into um, passenger rail services. So this was not just about passenger rail, it's about the entire rail system overall. So one primary result of this choice made politically about underinvestment in the inner city rail passenger system was a complete underinvestment in high-speed rail services, which all of us are very familiar with. One of the reasons why I'm sure we're having this conversation today, which is that in the United States, there are only 55 kilometers or so of track actually designed for rail travel at 150 miles per hour or above. So that's very literal <laughs> on the nation, uh, uh, the scale of the United States. So what this graph is showing is the kilometers of track designed for high-speed rail services put into service between 1963 and 2020. And what you can see here is that countries like Spain, Japan, France, Germany, and Italy all have more than a thousand kilometers of track throughout their country, two-way track, designed for high-speed rail passenger service. And again, the United States has about 55 as of today that are actually in active service. And when you look at this compared with China, it's just completely off the charts. So since 2007, the Chinese government has invested massively in inner city rail, and now has a network of about 30,000 kilometers of high-speed rail service across that country. And in 2018 alone, the result is that on high-speed routes in China, there are over 2 billion riders who took uh, high-speed trains throughout that country. That's much higher than the U.S. ever had on its inner city trains at the peak in 1920. And it's more than 60 times Amtrak's current uh, inner city rail passenger service. Um, and I think importantly, from the perspective of the purpose that high-speed rail is serving throughout our society, there are far more people now taking inner city high-speed rail trains in China than there are taking flights in China or actually taking flights in the United States. And it suggests that actually it's feasible to build a massive high-speed rail network at the continental scale that can displace 
thousands or millions of annual rides on planes and cars, by the way. This is something that China has really demonstrated over the past 15 years. And it's something that, you know, perhaps the United States, when looking at smaller European countries, didn't take as seriously as maybe it should now, now, now that we've seen what has happened in, in China. But the reality is that intercity rail ridership in the US and Canada too is minuscule compared not only to China, but also to almost every other wealthy country in the world. So what this graph is showing is the per capita annual intercity railway passenger miles with the US shown here at this very low rate on the left. So you see that people living in Italy, in Germany, the UK, France, Japan, all travel on inner city trains at far higher rates. Just, you know, they take advantage of this system to a far higher degree than people do in the United States. Um, we simply have developed an inner city rail program that is underused. And to a large degree, it's because we have simply chosen to underinvest in that system. So as we've underinvested in actually building out the tracks, I would contend that we have also underinvested in our capacity to improve our railways. So part of the problem has been that we have underinvested in Amtrak, we've underinvested in the federal capacity to uh, actually program out, fund, design, and plan the inner city rail system. We've also underinvested at the state level in creating state departments of transportation that are able to program out uh, planning for high-speed rail networks, but we also have a system that is just understaffed. And one example of that is looking at the total number of people who are employed by Amtrak versus the similar national rail carriers in other countries around the world. You can see that Amtrak is simply very much understaffed compared to the other agencies around the world. And that's an indication of the capacity that our national government or our national agencies have put into inner city rail. So this is the overall staff but it's representative of the current situation when it comes to planning, operations, and maintenance for these systems. So what can we do about it? This is where the recent federal debates about spending on intercity rail and potentially high-speed rail are quite interesting from my perspective and suggest that there might be a future ahead of us that could be really positive for high-speed rail in America. So the first thing that I wanna to point to is that Amtrak has proposed a major expansion in inner city rail services throughout the country. So this map diagram, which I put together, um, shows the current Amtrak services across the country in terms of trains per day in black. So you can see that all around the country, we have these lines that operate one train per day or even less sometimes, uh, you know, on, these, on the national network that is very similar to the one that was put together by the Nixon administration back, you know, 50 years ago. And then it shows in red some of the lines that Amtrak plans to create or to improve compared to the current system all over the country. And one thing that's really interesting about Amtrak's proposal and that I think signifies maybe a sea change in the way the agency is thinking about inner city rail is that rather than think about inner city rail as this national network that Amtrak has to provide just because it's providing this like almost poverty level service throughout the country, it's rather thinking about the intercity rail network as a series of nodes from which you have you know, new lines radiating out from major urban centers. And this is actually in line with the international precedent and the international best practices in terms of what services attract a lot of users. So you see here actually new lines and improved services radiating out, radiating out from Atlanta, from New York, from Washington, from Chicago, from Denver, from Los Angeles, Seattle, all the biggest American metropolitan areas, suggesting that Amtrak maybe has had a change in thinking about what it wants to prioritize and really wants to work on making sure that actually the biggest urban areas throughout the United States have good inner city rail radiating out in every direction. That said, I wanna say that a lot of the plans that Amtrak has put together so far, and this is available on Amtrak's um, connects us or connects us website online a lot of the plans they've put forward still reflect the vision that amtrak has which is that you're going to continue running most inner city rail passenger services on routes that are shared with the freight rail system and that operate at relatively low speed so when i looked at it 
uh, you know, for example, the new routes that were running between Raleigh and Wilmington or Raleigh and Asheville in my native North Carolina, what I found that actually was that Amtrak was actually proposing routes that were significantly slower than the, you know, driving to those destinations by car. And that raises some really major concerns about whether people will actually use all these new services that are provided. Because what's been demonstrated in study after study that looking internationally, the services that are used on inner city rail are those that are time competitive with automobile and often time competitive with flights. And unless Amtrak is able to actually demonstrate that it can do that, I'm not sure that all these new services that it's proposing are going to be attracting those additional users. So that's where the question of investing in high-speed rail, I think, is really important. And indeed, the bipartisan infrastructure bill that the US Congress is currently debating, it was passed by the Senate in August and is currently being debated in the House, could serve as an important place to rethink the way we're doing investments in the country. Or we could just actually fund the system that Amtrak had proposed. This is sort of an open question for us to consider. So, what exactly is in the bill as is currently being, as was passed by the Senate? So the primary funding that would go to inner city rail is shown here on the left side of the screen. So this is $66 billion that would go directly to inner city rail. 22 billion of that would go directly to Amtrak to provide national and Northeast corridor uh, services and improvements and pay for new trend. And then the rest of the money would go to uh, what is called in U.S. You know, congressional legislation, sort of the federal state corridor partnerships, which basically means that the federal government wants to engage directly with state governments to invest in corridors uh, that would see improved service over time. So most of that money could be directed to the Northeast Corridor, though it doesn't have to be. This is sort of the maximum amount that would go to the Northeast Corridor. Um, but all this money here if passed by the Congress, would get to be allocated by the US Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg right now, to spend on the projects that he or she thinks are most important for American society. So that's sort of an open question. What are the transportation or, or inner city rail projects that are most important to see investments in? Now, the bipartisan infrastructure bill also includes these programs, which by the way, I've noted they're sort of federal numbers here. Uh, here, there are a number of programs that could go to improve inner city rail if uh, the Secretary of Transportation decides that that's important. But I would presume that actually most of this money is going to go to other things like highways and freight rail. So we'll see how much money exactly goes into that. So the question is, if you stick all this money together, what would this look like from a historical perspective. Is this a lot of money? Is this a little bit of money? What, is it, what does it mean exactly? So what this graph is showing is how big that $66 billion investment looks like compared to past investments in the Federal Railroad Administration, including Amtrak. Between 1977, shown here on the left, and 2026 in the future, assuming that the infrastructure bill is passed. And this is all adjusted for inflation. What you can see is that actually in the late 1970s and the early 1980s, we did as a nation invest quite a lot in improving inner city rail. And almost all of this went to Northeast corridor improvements that ultimately by the late 1990s resulted in the introduction of a, a CELA uh, train service. You can see that actually was, there was quite a delay here between when most of the investments went in and when the Acela service started. We had a huge gap in funding for inner city train service between the mid 1980s and the late 2010s, which I think had a lot to do with generally a sort of lack of interest in using public investment uh, to fund inner city trains during that period. We saw a big burst in funding due to the Obama stimulus. Uh, and by the way, this is outlays, this is not expenditures, which is something we can discuss uh, in more detail if you all are interested, but essentially it just means this is when Congress allocated the money, not when it was spent. Then we had a decline, and then we would see this would be the projected money from the new legislation here on the right. So what you can see is that the projected money from the infrastructure bill would be at a similar to scale to what we saw in the late 70s, early 80s. The big question, I think, for a lot of rail advocates is, even if this $66 billion is funded, 
What happens after 2026? What happens in 2027? What happens in the 2030s? Will we have another decade after that point where you see another situation like this or another situation like this with virtually no inner city rail investment? Or are we at the start of a new approach to inner city rail investment where funding levels like this play out over the long term? And I think that actually is a really important question because right now inner city rail uh, funding in the United States does not have a dedicated long-term funding source. So the bipartisan infrastructure bill isn't the only source of new revenue being discussed in the US Congress today for inner city rail. So US Congress is also debating a large package that's called reconciliation, which is designed purely for the votes from Democratic Party members. And this is widely open in terms of what this would look like. There's a lot of debate, as you might have been following from a few senators about how big they want this package to be. But what we know right now is that as passed by the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, that package would include $10 billion specifically for high-speed rail. And that's money on top of the $66 billion that's stuck into the infrastructure package. There also is some money, about $10 billion in money here from some other programs that could also go to inner city rail, depending on how the funding is actually allocated. But again, we don't exactly know how any of this is going to shape, shape out. It's possible that no funding package is passed in the long term. It's also po possible that this could be increased, though that seems very unlikely at the moment. That's where we are in terms of congressional funding right now and the future for high speed rail. So we've seen the history of underinvestment. We've seen this big investment proposed by the US Congress. And now we have questions about how this money is going to be distributed. And the bigger question, I think, for us to consider is, how will the US be able to do this? Does the US, is the US capable or knowledgeable enough to actually distribute funding for inner city rail? I've already pointed to some of the issues we're contending with, like lack of bureaucratic and staff capacity to get some of this work done. And, but I think there are actually other issues at play. So the first thing to keep in mind is that the proposed funding for inner city rail at the congressional level does not come even close to meeting the need for improved inner city rail service that's been put out there by a variety of different organizations. So this graph here shows the total amount of funding that might be become, become available from Washington if both of those bills passed. So maximum, it could go to 100 billion if all of it were spent on improving corridors, but it's more likely to be somewhere around maybe maximum $50 billion going to improvements to inner city rail or the creation of new inner city rail corridors. And this money could be spent over the next five years or so. But if you sum up the amount of money expected to be needed for the Northeast Corridor, for California high-speed rail, for all those improvements Amtrak's proposing, and for other corridors like Raleigh to Richmond, Chicago to St. Louis, which is what's shown here at the bottom, you'll see that we will need a lot more money, okay? We're not even coming close to the need put out there by rail, rail advocates for investment in inner city rail. And this is a big issue. It's worth pointing out that the money here is proposed for five years of funding, whereas the expenditures needed for this would have to go out over many years. And so that's part of the reason why it's so important for us to know whether this five year of funding package that we're talking about for inner city rail is a blip, like we've seen in previous investment packages for inner city rail, or whether it's part of a sort of new long-term commitment from the federal government in spending on inner city rail. Big question. I think another problem we need to be thinking about is that construction costs in the United States are really high. And this is true for all sorts of infrastructure, not just rail, but also our buildings, um, our highways. All of these things cost a lot more in the United States than in any other country. And I'm not one to point my finger at any one specific issue. But what I do know is that when you compare the per mile costs of the proposed new projects in the United States compared to what is being spent in a lot of the other countries around the world, you can see that costs in the US are two to four times higher per kilometer uh, than other, other countries around the world. And I, I truly believe that getting these costs down is really important to accomplish many of the goals of improving inner city rail. Because let's say you had $30 billion for high speed rail service in the United States. If you were able to spend that money at Spanish levels in terms of cost, you could build four times as many tracks in terms of, of mileage. So that's a big question for us to be considering. 
Now, we also have some of the fundamental problems related to the federal distribution of power in the United States. The last time we tried inner city rail improvements in the United States during the Obama administration, political discord between Democrats and Republicans resulted in the cancellation of several lines. So it's hard to believe this is the case now, 12 years later, but the Obama administration was prepared to fund the full cost of opening new inner city rail lines between Cleveland and Cincinnati here, between Tampa and Orlando, and between Milwaukee and Madison. These weren't necessarily going to be full-scale high-speed rail, but they're going to be new inner city rail lines. And they would have been great examples of how to bring back inner city rail to many parts of the country that don't have it right now. But Republican governors in those states went out of the way to say, we don't want federal money to improve our inner city rails. Is this going to be an issue that we face in the future? It's a big question that we have to be asked. And any, any realistic rail program in the United States has got to find a way to identify a full funding agreement that is standard for transit projects, but not at all standard for inner city rail projects from the beginning. So consider the California high-speed rail project, which is pictured here. So what this is showing is the share of funding that's been allocated from different sources. So right now, about 27% of projected costs for that line has been committed from federal and state sources. So a lot of this money is coming from a bond that taxpayers passed in California, but also from uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions fees. The reality is that the majority of costs for that project are question marks. We don't know where that money is coming from. This is not how it's done in other parts of the world. The, the funding distribution for inner city rail projects in other parts of the world is determined from the beginning a contract is made between all the different entities involved to determine how much it's going to cost and how that funding is going to be allocated. And so I'm just giving you two examples from two lines uh, that were recently completed in France. So this is a line to Brittany. This is a line to Bordeaux. These lines have different funding distributions between the EU, the national government, regional, local governments. Um, but the reality is that they had their whole funding situation worked out from the very beginning. And the uncertainty we're facing in the United States is a huge concern because it makes it a lot more difficult to plan for the future. Now, one option is to look to private actors. And I don't want to dismiss this at all. So right now, as you might have known, on routes between Miami and Orlando, maybe between Orlando and Tampa, uh, between Houston and Dallas, and between Los Angeles and Las Vegas, Private investors have identified new funding to build new rail routes, some of which are going to be high-speed rail if they are complete. And in the case of Brightline in Florida, the project is being built in association with significant real estate investment, which you see here. So from my perspective, it's unclear whether these investments have long-term potential, because a lot of it has to do with whether they're able to attract the ridership necessary to make these things happen. Um, but I, I think that these are worth examining and they're worth considering supporting if the, if the public sector at the state or national level can come in and find ways to make these projects more feasible, whether that means providing additional grants or providing better environmental review over the coming years. That said, I think for advocates, I see two main areas, just from my personal perspective, where more involvement I think could be really helpful. So number one, I think much of this conversation has been in Washington so far, but the reality is that state governments could be doing a lot more to focus on improving inner city rail. So I think California and Illinois have shown how you can allocate some of their own resources to these programs, but other states throughout the country could really make similar investments. I mean, New York State is a great example where there is a state government that is relatively well off, that has the potential to significantly improve its inner city rail service, but simply has chosen not to make the choice. And I think this is particularly the case in the context of the proposed national investment program from Amtrak and the federal state corridor relationships that uh, the Congress wants to provoke. Um, I also think that advocates really should push for finding ways to encourage cost saving efforts without doing so in a way that detracts from the benefits of inner city rail investment. So from my perspective, this really requires thoughtful talking points that emphasize that cost savings are really necessary to be able to, to be, for, for us to be able to maximize the investment. But at the same time, we need to acknowledge that we continue to spend way more on roadways 
and other unsustainable modes than we spend on inner city rail. And, and that continues to be sort of the overriding issue in transportation mode. So finally, I'd just like to leave some questions that might be interesting for this conversation. I already see some, some questions in the chat. But number one, are inner city rail projects feasible in the US given federal government structure? I think you know, a lot of us want them to be feasible, but the degree to which that's the case remains to be seen. And relatedly, are US institutions as they currently exist capable of handling the bureaucratic engineering and operating difficulties of effective inner city rail? And if not, how do we pull in expertise from elsewhere? So thank you so much for uh, the ability to, to share my thoughts with you and I look forward to our conversations. Excellent. Thank you, Yona. That was very good. I wish I had answers to your questions at the end, but I don't. Um, but we can discuss. Um, okay, so Ted is saying, your assumptions seem to presume that the only viable source of funding for rail are from government, but I think you addressed that after he asked the, asked the question. Uh, so certainly there is a, a a uh, public role is as well. Um, are there any other questions for Yona before I kind of go off on my own track here? Uh, and Ryan is asking, is there a role for advocates in fixing the governance issue? And what might the ideal government governance structure look like? Um, is France an example and how do we persuade, I'm gonna change his language, for uh, states to work together? Uh, uh, so actually, I, I, so thank you, Ryan, and uh, hello. <laughs> um, I, you know, I think it's actually interesting that when you look at other countries around the world, you'll find that their rail advocates think that their national agencies are doing terrible jobs, which from a US perspective is pretty hilarious from a comparative approach. But one thing that's really interesting in France is that faced with concerns about the problems with the national rail carrier SNCF, which again, does a much better job than I think the US does, but still has problems. There actually is a new cooperative uh, sort of nonprofit organization that's going to start launching rail services on routes that it thinks are underprovided in, in France. And that rail service is going to open, I think next year, and they're going to be providing uh, services on routes that uh, go between uh, regional cities that are currently underserved by SNCF because um, the French National Rail Service is very focused on Paris as the primary route. And I think that raises questions like, you know, I think, you know, all of us are, are maybe, and I, I brought in some of the private examples of inner city rail services being offered by Brightline and Texas High Speed Texas Central High Speed Rail, maybe there are options for cooperative or nonprofit organizations to work with freight railroads. I mean, as crazy as that seems, maybe there are opportunities out there to add new services to build on the Amtrak network and provide, in some cases, alternatives to the Amtrak network. So you don't have to get on the train at 3 a.m. if you want to leave Cincinnati. You know, I mean, maybe we don't have to wait for significant new investments to start to get the slow speed operating services if we find new, new approaches to providing um, those operations. And I, I, I welcome that, that opportunity. You know, you talked about Cincinnati at slow speed. Um, the length of the schedule right now is such that it would be a good overnight trip from Chicago to Cincinnati if it were scheduled right. So I would really like to see it added frequency that leaves later from Chicago so that it gets Cincinnati at the beginning of the business day. Uh, we had that- As would like I, as somebody who loves Cincinnati and Chicago, I mean, it's, they would be great to you know? Yeah, and the, the, the airport is not convenient in Cincinnati and it's, it's no longer a hub for anybody. So I think that would be a very valuable service. And it worked for me for Louisville a couple of times while we had a very slow train to Louisville. It was perfect for leaving at the end of the day. Um, I, I, uh, I, I have to be distracted. I looked up uh, while you were ta talking about China, I got a little distracted and I just wanted to share this with the audience. Um, this is the train schedule from Beijing to Guangzhou. 
And these are the day trains. So there's what, five day trains? And they do that in nine and a half, eight hours. That's the distance of Chicago to Miami. And they're doing it in eight, nine hours. I looked up this ticket here is about 135 bucks and then business class, which is a lie down flat bed is $450. And then the interesting thing talking about overnight sleeper trips, they actually have more sleeper trains making that trip every day uh, than they do day trains. Mm. Um, and so, you know, again, the high speed line is not just about the end, it's about everything in the middle, but these are the, the services that are possible because of that. Um, so I was a little distracted, wanted to bring that up. Uh, but, um, and then the other was, you know, you were talking about how the, China, the Japanese opened high speed rail in 1964. And all of a sudden, three other countries said, well, we can't let this go unnoticed and said, we're gonna do high-speed rail with the US through the High-Speed Ground Infrastructure Act or the Ground Transportation Act at Italy and France, right? So the US was the first to deliver 125 mile an hour service with the Metro liners. The Italians were the first to build a new high-speed line, but the French were the put the whole package together. We were actually the first to do a train that could go faster than 150 miles an hour, which was the UA turbo train that still holds the North American speed record at 171 miles an hour. But um, just another interesting point with what you were talking about. Um, I also wanna say, I two weeks ago or a week ago, spent a couple of days at the meeting where the state officials who deal with railroads meet with the federal with each other and the federal government every year um, and they held that in Milwaukee a couple of weeks ago and there clearly is a much deeper knowledge in the bureaucracy of how to implement and there's a much longer term view than there there was for the Obama administration. So I find that incredibly encouraging. Um, there's also a desire to do more in-depth planning before you actually get to doing projects. I think mm -hmm. that's an exciting step forward. Um, and so this money that's out there, if it passes, isn't enough, as you pointed out, but it's enough to get that bureaucracy going. Get it going. Yeah. And then the key thing is, as advocates, I think we need to not say that that's the plan, like on the Midwest plan. That's not the plan. That's the discussion for how we get started. It's really the states who have to, to ramp this up. And we should be focused on getting local municipality leaders focused on their state capital saying, you need to really ramp up the planning and go after this federal money. Um, and actually, so we are, do, should we turn to some of those questions about the state that I'm seeing in the chat? Absolutely. If you see one that I haven't noticed, please. Yeah, do. well, so um, Ann Macquarie says, um, uh, can you give ideas of what sort of funding sources states do or might use? And then Susan Pantel notes uh, that state Republicans often oppose rail on, on party lines. So those two questions are related, but different. Um, okay. You know, just to give you my perspective quickly, um, you know, California has actually allocated a substantial amount of money from its carbon um, revenues to high-speed rail, and other states, if they were so inclined, could could make a similar choice. I would also add that a huge amount of the federal money to highways can be flexed tomorrow. State governments have the ability to choose to spend their money from the federal government on the you know, state transportation program on, on, on projects that are not highways. The problem is that we have state governments that don't wanna do that. And we need to change that conversation at the state government to say that actually you have funding sources available that you could immediately allocate um, to, you know, to these important inner city rail projects. And I would say that similar to that, you know, most state governments collect gas tax revenues, which they could also use to fund inner city rail. But they are not, some states have legislative uh, or constitutional rules that prevent them from doing that, but most states actually allow the use of that funding on any sort of transportation. And so I think that there are big opportunities using existing sources 
that states, if they get local leadership to push them on it, can advance it. Now, Susan is, I think, pointing out appropriately that there are, you know, there are state governments that simply are just not interested and don't want to. And I think she's right that there are significant limitations from advocates. You know, what can advocates do when there's political ideological opposition to inner city rail? And I think, you know, one of the key areas is supporting ways to, for private investors to go in. I think the fact that we're seeing private investment in Texas and Florida is not a surprise given those states' ideological, the ideological views of the leaders in those states. And I think the question for advocates is, what are the best ways to influence um, the rollout of those projects? And I can think of, I can think of a few. One is helping states find ways to reduce environmental uh, impact review for high-speed rail lines so that they shorten the process for these private actors going in, investing. Second is trying to convince state governments to, for example, let, let inner city rail uh, operators use highway right-of-ways at a cheaper or free cost, uh, which you know is, is up for debate right now in Florida. Uh, and then there's the question of local land use around stations, where I, again, think advocates can play a big role. I, I think there's there are very different views in Florida around the Bright Line stations about what should be built versus what is being proposed in Houston and Dallas around their, their future high-speed high speed lines, which right now are sort of like surrounded by modes of parking and will ultimately be detrimental to the high-speed project. So I think those are all areas that advocates can be involved even in, in states that are otherwise against state funding. Absolutely. And I, uh, to add to that, the Amtrak in the state of Illinois is actually paid for out of the road fund. Um, and the new uh, Talgo trains that Oregon is operating were paid for with highway money. So the states can use highway money if they choose to. It's a matter of priorities. Absolutely. Um, and then what was the other? Oh, in terms of the Republicans. So the, the key is to find the leaders in the state in both parties and find people in their districts that will support it. That's really the way you make it happen, is you start with those key leaders at the state level and get them, people in their district, to, to start advocating for passenger rail. Um, so Maurice Ball has this interesting question uh, saying, you know, there's this long history of how transportation construction was used to segregate areas. What are your thoughts towards rail investment in low-income areas and areas with a high, higher proportion of people of color? So I think this is a really interesting question because uh, the way we do transportation investment in the United States, as, as Maurice points out, historically has focused infrastructure on destroying neighborhoods of color and, and, and communities where lower income families live. And obviously that's totally unacceptable. And even today you see uh, projects in places like Houston that are highway expansions that are destroying neighborhoods of color. That's obviously something we should try our best to avoid at all costs. Um, I also would, would think that, um, you know, our approaches towards reducing costs like property acquisition often has the tendency to encourage using corridors that are considered cheaper because they are in neighborhoods of color that where property values are lower. And this is, raises significant concerns if we're talking about a national inner city rail project. But I think the good news is that for one, these issues are more, discussed than they were 10 years ago. I mean, people are at least aware of this conversation and are at least talking about it, which I think is, is progress. I think the second important thing is that in the reconciliation bill, uh, which again, might not pass, <laughs> there is a significant amount of funding dedicated specifically towards connecting transportation infrastructure with communities uh, where affordable housing uh, is present and where there's a desire to increase racial and social equity. And I think uh, that kind of program could be dedicated towards, for example, shared regional rail and uh, inner city rail projects if allocated appropriately. So I'm hopeful that this issue becomes more prominent in, um, in the conversation about, about inner city rail uh, spending. Um, so uh, Ted, we would not uh, talk about specific officials. That's 
not something we're allowed to do as a C3. Ted, we are um, all C3 people. We cannot target individuals. For <laughs> <laughs> um, the key is who's ever there. It's about getting the people who have the most influence with that person to influence that person, right? This isn't about that representative. It's about finding leaders in the community who are willing to go and influence that person. Um, we should start with it, Illinois though, Rick. I mean, we should start with Illinois by getting better passenger trains in Illinois, right? Yes, we should have much better passenger trains in Illinois. And there's uh, three major, er four major areas that aren't served right now in Illinois, Rockford, Moline, and in the Quad Cities. Uh, Peoria and Decatur. Uh, so it's it's time to figure out how to get them on the map and also run much fa faster service between Chicago and St. Louis, absolutely. Um, I think Peter Laws is pointing to some of the, the obstacles we face in certain states. He's, he's pointing out that Oklahoma insists on using motor fuel excise tax, the gas tax, uh, on widening roads that don't need to be widened and sometimes replacing obsolete bridges. You know, this is, and this is a huge problem for state advocates. If you're faced with a situation like that, it's a challenge, not just for inner city rail, but for all sustainable transportation initiatives. And I think that, that there's no easy answer to that other than that we need to convince state legislators to change their approaches, um, you know, and we have to make the, the right arguments about why these roadway expansions are not necessarily good for our society from health, pollution, and other aspects. That's the only, the only answer I have. Financial, yes. Yeah. Um, and then Colin has, what in your opinion is the role of grassroots organizers, uh, organizing in general public to support bottom-up pressure? You know, we were talking about this before the call, uh, Rick, and I think, you know, I'm not a huge fan of uh, certain tech billionaires who, you know, are, you know, use their platforms to influence too much of the conversation, but I think that the fact that you have billionaires out there getting people excited about change and asking people to imagine a different future, whether that's in space travel or modes of ground transportation, ultimately is reflective of the fact that if you give people a vision of something that is really positive about the future and that could change their lives, and you explain how the investment that you're proposing will change their lives, I think people are excited by that. I think there's so much public reception to, to these kind of concepts. And you know, you can see that in the results of state elections or bond issues or sales taxes that have been passed for rail and uh, public transportation uh, objectives. All over the country, when you propose increasing people's taxes to pay for improved transit, people are much more likely to vote for it than against it. They're willing to pay more to see a positive benefit for their community. So we, as people who are in favor of inner city rail and high speed rail, need to be continuing to hammer down why these projects are so beneficial for our society. And I think it's a winning message. We just have to find a way to make it as, as communicated as possible and connected to a funding source. Yeah, and that's, and when we talk about what, what we're about, we're about optimism and about both transformative in the future and let's get some immediate immediate wins now, right? Um, and that kind of leads to Ryan's question, which is, you know, we've been focused mostly on the supply side. So right, building new lines, running more trains, but looking at the demand side, how can advocates more effectively demonstrate existing demand and reveal latent demand for better, faster trains? Yeah, what do you think about that, Rick? I mean, my, my general perspective is that when I look at inner city rail pricing, I get, I get very concerned that we are pricing a huge share of the market out of taking trains, um, especially in the Northeast corridor. And I think the result is that because Amtrak is focused on making sure that it's operationally profitable, uh, especially in the Northeast corridor, it is choosing not to expand those rail routes to the maximum number of people. Now, the newest cell trains are going to expand the capacity and hopefully maybe increase the number of people who can take advantage of those routes. But I do think that the fare structure as currently exists on Amtrak's uh, services is not conducive to 
demonstrating that existing demand. I think there's a lot of latent interest in traveling around this country by train, but their, their prices aren't reflective of that in a way that's reasonable. So I, I do think that, you know, I would hope that Amtrak thinks more about how it can build higher levels of capacity on its train so it can reduce prices, reduce, you know, the cost per passenger to provide a service. I think that can be an important, important element. What, what, what else is out there, Rick? Oh, well, yeah, so I think that has been a major, major problem. You know, this kind of fantasy that we should have operating, uh, you know, it's nuts. So they're asking for $100 billion to rebuild the infrastructure while pinching pennies on running trains in order to charge higher fares. And then you don't have the political support because most of the masses now are driving or taking the, the bus. Uh, so uh, there really has to be a way to get a lot more seats on the existing routes. And I would say that for the sleeper train routes too. I, it, the tickets on those are way too high. They need to figure out how to make the trains longer and put more people on them. The other thing I wish they would do is start keeping track of people's searches and then making that public and saying, you know, we turned away this many people in this corridor. Uh, this provides a basis, right? That would be another thing that Amtrak could do. I've been actually noodling, Ryan, thank you for bringing the question up. How could we start showing this? Um, and in my specific case, is we've got a couple of studies that are underway now in Illinois for expansion. Um, and it occurred to me, those studies don't really go and ask the potential riders when they wanna take the train or for what purpose. And maybe we could provide a role for that in, in helping people say, this is when I wanna to get to Chicago or whatever. Uh, so that's a very good question that we need a better answer to. Um, should we, um, I'm, I'm, I'm cognizant of the time. Yes. Uh, and I'm aware that some participants want to leave, but I, but I do want to, I, we can keep answering questions if that's of interest, but I do want to say for those of you who have to leave, thank you for uh, attending this conversation. I'm really excited about it. Uh, feel free to get in touch with me personally if, if I can be helpful in any way. And I'm sure the same for Rick and I'll let him talk however you wish. Okay. Excellent. And thank you for being a, such a good host. <laughs> my, 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 <laughs> um, <laughs> we, we, uh, are there any more questions? Uh, there is an interesting one here, which, which I have, you know, I strongly believe we need to get to a lot more DMUs because they really oh, yes. reduce the operating costs. What's your opinion on why we haven't seen them uh, working here. Don't you think, don't you think, that the, well, this is where the lack of, what's, what's been really interesting is that when, when there have been new line openings that act like they're transit, so I'm thinking like um, the new service between um, uh, Fort Worth and, and Dallas Airport, the, uh, the Oceanside Escondido line, the New Jersey Transit River line, those are sort of almost inner city rail because they're, they're so long in, in service. They, they're sort of, but they're run by transit agencies as commuter rail. And in those cases, transit agencies have said, okay, we'll use DMUs. These are good options for this service. And I think that that tells you something, which is that in my opinion, the transit agencies are a little more creative and a little more willing to look internationally to see best practices and say, oh, look, this is, this is a type of, of transportation option that we should be using. Whereas you have state departments of transportation that I think are very isolated in their thinking. And um, maybe those state departments of transportation need to be talking and Amtrak needs to be talking with their transit agencies to say, what's out there? What are these other technologies? Yeah, I'm very happy to see Metro is talking about running what are the self-contained train sets? Because they're not intending them to be diesel, but um, and they're not going to have overhead wire. Um, so that's that's progress. Um, I think we have a real challenge with um, uh, liability. So um, our train designs probably are less safe than 
European train designs when it comes to being in an accident. Uh, but that's not what the regulations say. And certainly the class one railroads who are private businesses don't want the liability of trying something new. I think yeah. that's another issue. And then the third issue would be economies of scale. So you've got to get to the point where a bunch of people are buying them all at once. Um, but I think it's really critical that we get there. Absolutely. Yeah, and I'm, um, I don't know. I, it is frustrating because there, there have been sort of momentary efforts on the MBTA and um, Long Island Railroad systems to also talk about EMUs or, or DMUs, depending on the, on the line. And that seemed to have disappeared. And I'm, what, I'm just wondering, are there um, agency planners who just, yeah, I mean, you know, Peter points out, we've never done it that way. And I think that is often <laughs> the sort of understanding out there. But, you know, it is true that in most parts of the world, inner city rail passenger services are not provided by locomotive hauled train sets. They're provided by DMUs and EMUs. So how do we change that? What's the, what's the process? Yeah, and I think uh, that's just one of the innovations we need, that you need enough money to get over some key hurdles. And so that's why even though, you know, if you add up all the projects we should be building, 66 billion doesn't look like a lot, but it's enough that you could start dealing with the um, supply chain issues um, and enough that you can start thinking outside of the box on some of these, these things. Um, you know, the other thing is we need Amtrak to be much, much bigger than it is. But yeah. I think there's also a need to have others who can try different things and maybe this one works and maybe that one doesn't, but, but that's it. Can I pose a question to you, Rick? Yes, absolutely. Um, how do you feel about open access to the routes that, current, that Amtrak currently provides. So I alluded to what was happening in France with the, um, with the nonprofit profit cooperative providing services. You know, Spain just opened up its high-speed rail services to uh, actually French high-speed trains. Italy has uh, multiple train operators providing high-speed services um, that are competing with one another. Is that something we should be looking for in the United States or do you think it's a problem? I, well, first of all, I think we should never say open access in the U.S. Uh, because that is uh, that leads to very bad consequences in the minds of the class ones. And, and we don't want to raise that issue. Uh, but the bigger question is, could we have different operators in different parts of the world or the, the country? And um, I think that we really need that. Uh, but that doesn't get over the fact that somebody's going to have to cover the, the cost of buying the equipment. Somebody's gonna have to invest in the railroad to make it faster um, and not necessarily faster than 80 miles an hour, but more crossovers, less 30 mile an hour running, less 10 mile an hour running, a lot more uh, reliability. Um, and somebody's got to cover the operating support for at least a number of years. Uh, so, the, so having a different operator doesn't solve those problems, but certainly in some places we should, I think. Yes. How does that make sense to you or? Yeah, I mean, well, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm seeing Peter's con or question saying open access is poison uh, because of Amtrak's rights. It's, it's, um, it is, it is not clear to me what the, um, the appropriate distribution of governance is in the rail industry on the passenger rail. I think you can see positive elements of different systems. I think there's a long history of European single operator services being relatively well done. Um, there's also the example of tracks being owned by one organization and, and then you know operations being sort of distributed around the country, like Peter was pointing out in the UK and which we, you, you were proposing, Rick. And then there's what's happening in Europe now, which is the open access on tracks, which means competition over the single routes. And, you know, there is that, um, I, I think that they all have pros and cons in terms of, um, of what benefits they can provide. Yeah, and, and it's actually more expensive to have and more complicated to have multiple operators. 
So it, it comes down to, are you willing to invest and, and make it work? Um, and clearly when Italo started operating between Rome and Milan, um, the Italian operator upped its game. And mm -hmm. so everybody was much better off and they more, if they doubled the number of trains and more than doubled the number of people riding those trains. So that's exciting. But the core issue here is the one we've got to really deal with is how do we turn passenger trains into a money-making venture for the class one railroads? Um, and that's, that's a tough nut to crack. And, and I think we have to get there, not only for the passenger side, but because the railroads for our national good need to start running freight trains a lot more, more like passenger trains uh, with shorter freight trains, faster freight trains. Um, and you don't get that without with total private investment in the tracks that private investors are always going to focus on longer trains, fewer trains on less and less track, which becomes less and less reliable and kind of. Well, but down. Rick, isn't, isn't sort of an alternative perspective to simply say we've been trying that for the last 50 years and working with freight railroads is toxic and we just need to give up on it and, and create passenger only tracks and let the freight railroads live by themselves. No, I don't think we have tried it for 50 years. I think okay. we've, I think we've said that the customer for the class ones that is going to get by far the best service is going to pay a dirt cheap rate. And then we're surprised that it doesn't work well. Um, I think that's the core nut we have to crack is it has to make good investment sense for the class one. And I don't think it's reasonable to think that we are going to build a completely new railroad across the entire country. 80% of this is going to have to be on existing railroads. We're going to have to figure that out. And Virginia, you know, so Virginia is an interesting example where they're buying parts of the right of way, but not enough to run the frequency of service that it would make sense to have completely separate tracks. Right. So they've got the problem with Ashland where they're going to narrow down to two tracks. Um, and so we really have to we have to think with where we are. And we are that our national railroad infrastructure is owned by private companies. So we've got to figure out how those private companies become allies and and uh, and move forward and, and start thinking about expanding their businesses. Now, I want to be clear, though, there are cases where it needs to be publicly owned and uh, probably uh, that's at least 100 miles in each direction out of Chicago for one um, where it's publicly owned and there's only passenger trains on it. Um, and there are other cases like that. But for the whole national network, we've got to crack that nut of running passenger trains on freight railroads. So. Uh, is there anything else that uh, people have out there? Uh, no, thank you, Yona, for, for joining us. And thank you, everybody else, for coming along. Um, we, I promise that in the short, a short period of time, we'll have a presentation um, on the Midwest framework that was just released. Uh, we're uh, very excited about this progress that has been made. It's incredibly aggressive, which they didn't really communicate in their release of it. So uh, look for that. And if you enjoyed this, please go to highspeedrail.us, highspeedrail.us, and click that donate button up in the right-hand corner so we can keep doing these. Again, Yona, thank you for, for joining us, and we look forward to talking again. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, everybody. Yeah.